My name is Tom Thornton, and uh, Harold Martin is here, and we're here to give a little introduction to this publication that we both worked on, but with I'm the responsible or irresponsible editor of, uh, which means all mistakes are my fault, of course. So, and it's uh, called Hathli Kohas Ani Sahu, and our grandparents' names on the land, and it's uh, we describe it as a cultural <coughs> atlas, uh, and we want to tell you a little bit about what's in it and how the project came about and uh, hopefully have some people who participated in the project say some words because I know some of them are here and uh, and then we'll have some time for question and answer hopefully and maybe a book signing after. Um, I like this quote uh, down here at the bottom from Fred Friday of Cake uh, that's in the Goldschmidt and Haas report which I think a lot of you are familiar with if you work on land use issues. Uh, but he said the native people know all the points and rocks and every little area by name. If I told you, told you all the names of the places I know, it would fill many pages. These areas were used so much that we were familiar with every little place. Well, uh, we tried to do our best. It did fill many pages, uh, but lots more could be said. So uh, I think that statement that was made 50 years ago is, is very, very true. Um, as an academic, uh, I got interested in place names uh, when I was at University of Washington doing my PhD. And uh, my advisor there, Eugene Hun, was a person who uh, had studied place names among the Sahaptan speaking peoples of the plateau. And uh, so I got some training from him. And then when I had the opportunity to first come to Southeast Alaska, I actually worked for Bob Schroeder, who's here in the audience, and he gave me some space to pursue that, uh, that interest and what became a love of mine uh, while I was an intern at Fish and Game my very first year of graduate school. And then we later worked on place names projects together in Glacier Bay. Um, but I think place names are interesting as a field of study, and of course there's a whole field of study called onomastics that looks at place naming across cultures. Um, but the first thing to say about them is they are a cultural universal. I mean, there may be a culture out there that doesn't name places, but uh, I've, I've never heard of it. Uh, so as a social scientist, uh, it's interesting to compare how places are named across cultures. And of course, in a place like Southeast Alaska, you have layers and layers of names. And so you can compare how different cultures, different languages uh, look at names on the same landscape, right? Because you have Spanish names, you have English explorer names, you have Russian names, you have Clinket names, Haida names, uh, Eak, Chugash, uh, and then you have, of course, uh, the, mo the most recent English naming. Um, but also, place names are sources of, of knowing. They're, they're, uh, they're kind of containers, if you will. They hold a lot of information. And uh, they're also one of the ways that people express their diversity. And, uh, that, I think that was an overwhelming theme in this study was how diverse uh, the, naming, the names are. I mean, there are patterns in naming, but they really do represent as much the diversity of the cultures of Southeast Alaska as they do uh, the unity. Um, and the importance of knowing them was stated by Linnaeus a long time ago when he said, if you don't know the names, your knowledge of things perishes. And uh, Kenny Grant later took that statement and clinketized it, right? Uh, <laughs> by uh, essentially saying, if you don't know the names, your clinket way of life will drift away forever, which is, of course, much more poetic. But that would be the way it was, would be understood. And uh, I think that was a real motivation for us to document place names, just because they are such an important link of culture. They're the intersection of language, culture, and environment. Um, there also can be thought of as artifacts. Um, we think of an artifact as a material object, but you can have a symbolic artifact. And when a place name is laid down, it tends to be quite durable. It stays in an area. And when you discover it later, maybe generations after it was laid down, it, it's going to tell you something about how the people understood and used that place. Um, it's also uh, place names, a lot of them anyway, are ecofacts. They tell you something about the ecology of an area, the relationships 
uh, that exist there, say between plants and animals or between uh, the geology and the, uh, the vegetation, etc. Then, of course, they can be uh, potent signs for things. And uh, one of the uh, statements we heard over and over again so many times, I don't think I could attribute it to one person. Uh, you know, every name has a story behind it. And so there's much more information than just the semantic translation of the name itself. And uh, that's one thing we tried to get in this volume, but we, of course, could only give a smattering. If you really documented all of the cultural associations and stories associated with names, it would fill many, many volumes. Another idea is that they're, they tend to be uh, endangered in a lot of places. Um, and, you know, it's an, a process of colonialism, I guess is the word that uh, Lance Twitchell used uh, to describe this process of erasure that's occurred. But all of these names used to be the common way to refer to places in southeast Alaska. And they never made it onto maps, but beyond that they were erased, really, from uh, cultural memory with all the policies against speaking your language and using um, native place names in the parlance. And it's interesting that a lot of the early explorers uh, wanted to keep those names because they recognized them as being very descriptive. And there's a wonderful passage from Glaive, I think one of the explorers went up in the interior about how important and descriptive these place names are. And he recommended keeping them on the maps. But, and some are there, of course, but they tend to be uh, bodlerized or distorted uh, when they're converted into English. Um, so they, they are endangered in some sense, but maybe not as endangered as we thought, because we were able, I think, to recover a good many of the native place names that probably existed um, in southeast Alaska. Certainly not all of them, but probably quite a few of them. Then finally, the descriptive force of names. I think this is uh, something that, that overwhelmed me time and time again, is you, you just hit a name that would really really describe a place, uh, like this one over on Cruzoff Island, Sitka Point, Shock -a, Driftwood Point, pretty good description of what's going on there. And uh, you just don't find that level of description in many of the English names. Um, when I became a college professor, I actually started trying to teach people um, about place names, but also about studying place names as artifacts. And I, I actually used some of the first names that I learned when I came up and worked for Fish and Game and worked on this sockeye fishery at Sitco Bay. And uh, I, I would put this map up and I would say, you don't speak Clinket, you don't know this area, but based on what's there, what, come up with three hypotheses about this culture. And the students were pretty good at it. You know, they'd say things like, oh, well, I bet they're a maritime oriented culture because most of the names are down along the shoreline. They're not on the mountaintops, although some are. Um, they would look at the English translations and say, oh, well, they, they think sockeye uh, salmon is a pretty important resource. And that's, that's a pretty good observation. Um, and then they might say something about the importance of creeks or bays uh, and so on, or halibut. And, and that's true, all of those resources are in there. But usually what people miss is the fact that the, that the Clinket nomenclature is much more dense than the English nomenclature in this bay. So there's only Sitco Bay, Point Craven on this map. There are other names on the outskirts and Sitco Creek, but you actually have uh, 12 Clinket names. <coughs> so the density is much, much higher. And uh, that's a phenomenon that occurs around every, just about every sockeye stream in southeast Alaska. You have a, a density of names. But in many areas, the, the nomenclature is much denser than in English. And that's interesting because you're talking about an oral culture here. And when you're, when you're a culture of writing, you know, you can afford to put a name anywhere you want and fill up the map with, with names. So the fact that the Clinket geography is actually denser, uh, the toponymy is denser, is quite interesting. Uh, and then, of course, one of the themes of celebration is how place connects with, with art and uh, everything else in the culture. And that was really my 
interest in, uh, in Clinkett. It's so rich, the connections. And um, I don't know if anybody's here from Angoon, but um, uh, Lydia George, I think, put her finger on it when she said, oh, well, there's not just the name, but there's the story, there's the song, <coughs> and there's the design, and it all goes together, and that's how we remember our places and our history. And um, so in the book I wrote on place and being among the Clinket, uh, I describe that as Clinket multimediacy, <laughs> because it's kind of a multimedia theory about how you remember places and geography. And the fact that so many names are still remembered, I think, is a testament to how, how effective that system is in uh, conserving uh, the geography and the nomenclature. And uh, uh, I, was, I actually went to Lydia's potlatch in November, and they introduced a new screen that has a lot of the same imagery here. But, but this red salmon is a reference to this Gatini and Sitco Creek, and this little copper shield is a reference to Tinaguni, the, the uh, spring. And uh, this double-headed raven is a reference to, um, uh, where is it? Yes, Katuku, Raven's Cave. So you basically have a map uh, there that you wear on your body, and uh, it's a pretty good way of saying this place belongs to us, and we belong to this place. Uh, very effective. Now, in, in academic language, I discovered that there are other reasons to study places. One, one of them is people love them. People love places, and uh, it makes place names a fun thing to study because people appreciate their own names uh, and, and what's behind them. But in academic language, it's sometimes referred to as, as topophilia, uh, love of place, or the, all of the emotional connections between the physical environment and human beings. And then another term that comes up is historia, which is a kind of reference to how place can stand for a community's history or uh, an, be an, uh, a compendium of place names can be an atlas of eternity. Um, and then I, I think when I discovered this concept of shagoon, which is so complex and important in Clinket culture, and I learned most, about, most of what I know about it from the Dauenhauer's works, because they've talked about it quite a bit, it's really the same idea. It, I think it embodies both topophilia and historia. Um, and this, but it also gives it a personal identity element of, you know, who we are now, what, or sorry, uh, yeah, is what we are now, what we have been since the beginning, and everything that our children must become. That's the way Austin Hammond defined it. But that, uh, that idea embraces, I think, both topophilia and historia when it's applied to place. And uh, it comes out in some of the, the narratives, uh, like this one from Richard Dalton, when he says, uh, looking at a place in Dundas Bay, I see my grandfathers on that beach, I see my uncles, because this is the place they were in love with, because it provided like an icebox. We always knew it was there. Okay, that's an expression, I think, of this, of this idea of obviously love of place, but also uh, this idea of historia. Then there are, of course, lots of themes. Uh, <coughs> one of them is raven names, of course. We all know the role that raven played in creating Southeast, but um, the names are actually more interesting than just uh, places associated with a mythological raven. Uh, you actually have uh, references to the abiotic environment, to the geology, and this was a place called Yesh Kawut, uh, Raven's Beads, but um, John Palms, who was a colleague of mine at Fish and Game, got interested in Clinket, sings Clinket songs, and uh, learned the language, and talked to Harold, and actually went down to the place in Cake where this occurs in Saginaw Bay, and he found some of these raven's beads, and they're actually fossilized crinoids, and uh, they occur on a limestone bench, which is quite a unique um, geological formation in Southeast, there aren't that many of them. And it's obviously a very rich place for these fossils. So 
there is a raven story behind it and how he made a necklace from these beads for his wife and so on. But it's also a very uh, important reference to a unique abiotic environment. So again, uh, in terms of how places are named, we found lots of references to plants and animals, probably over a hundred, I don't remember the exact total, plants and animals that are referenced in names. Uh, the vast majority are very descriptive of the topography, okay? Hydrographic, if they're talking about the tide uh, or the current, and also terrestrial. Lots refer about 14, 15% to habitation sites, historical to events, uh, and very, very few actually to people's names. Uh, so it's typically the, the fact that people take their names from places rather than places being named after people, which is the English pattern. And then I'll just say quickly, uh, on the biocultural diversity front, this is uh, kind of an interest that's developing uh, uh, in me in terms of where, where you go next after you've sort of documented place names. But one of the things that everybody's concerned about is the loss of biodiversity in the world and how uh, a lot of our species are going extinct and so on. And uh, it's been shown that there's a relationship, a correlation between biological diversity and cultural diversity. And so to the extent that biological diversity decreases, cultural diversity also tends to decrease. And where cultural diversity is particularly rich, biological diversity also tends to be rich. And you can see that even within the Northwest Coast by this uh, slightly distorted map. But the Northwest Coast is actually one of the most, uh, from a linguistic standpoint, one of the most diverse areas in North America in terms of languages. Uh, so you've got 57 different languages between uh, Southeast Alaska down to Northern California. And uh, you compare that to, say, the Arctic, where you essentially have one language, Inuit, that spreads from the very northern part of Alaska all the way over to Greenland. So very, very diverse linguistically, and we know, of course, very, very diverse culturally. And uh, this is reflected even within culture areas like Southeast Alaska. So I've been working with a, uh, a biodiversity specialist at Oxford, and uh, we uh, did an experiment putting up all the points uh, that are named that we have in the database that, that are, is in this book. And first of all, you see that it obviously covers the whole region pretty well, particularly on the coast. And then uh, using a, f a fairly rough and tumble way, we, we tried to identify all of the biodiversity hotspots, the rich uh, species, rich areas, both marine and terrestrial, and then to over overlay them to see how they corresponded. And it's a kind of a... Uh, uh, it takes a while to explain how it did it, but I don't need to do that just to tell you that there's a, a high degree of correspondence between areas that are very, very dense in names and, and areas that have a high degree of biodiversity. It's not a perfect correspondence, and there's lots of places that are important culturally that may not be <coughs> biodiverse. But it's, just, it's surprising how, how close that correlation is. And uh, I think it's, it speaks to the fact that Obviously, the areas that were biodiverse and rich in species were very, very important to people. And so they settled there and, and named them accordingly. Um, I thought I'd show you a couple of maps. Most of the maps in the book look like this. Um, we did ma uh, one set of maps per community, and uh, Harold's going to explain how the process worked with communities in just a minute. Uh, but we typically had meetings, we produced draft maps, and then we uh, finalize them. Uh, and the large set of maps was produced for each community. And uh, those, along with a database, and those were given to actually the tribes, the federally recognized tribes, when we finished the project. And then when we decided to do this, we just did it as a summary and did what we call overview maps. So they're not meant for navigation necessarily, but they're meant to show you just how rich the, the native toponymy is. And every map says, <coughs> for reference only, if you want more information, talk to the tribe. 
So we're trying to direct people to the most knowledgeable sources. Um, and just a couple of final comments. I think there are some really interesting connections that we did find here. And uh, we only, as I said, could put a fraction of them in the book. But um, this one uh, coming from Cake uh, is a narrative that was shared by the uh, organized village of Cake and uh, is a narrative by Johnny C. Jackson uh, about the Kutch Adis uh, clan and their precursors return to Southeast Alaska. And uh, if you just uh, follow this, I'll read a little bit of it. It's really incredible what he's suggesting happened here. And I think it's, it's very relevant in terms of the importance of names, their longevity, their um, resilience, uh, and maybe even their role in, in adaptation. But he talks about uh, during the flood, uh, he said, my grandfathers had all replaced each other, the leaders of the Kach Adi clan. When we still lived in the interior, they didn't care for the interior where the flood had left them since our former homes were on the coast. So they set out to search. Fresh water flows to salt water, so they followed the river. We who now live in Cake, we came out from the Nas River. Uh, and then he quotes his ancestors. Let's look for our original homeland, they said. After traveling northwest, they found their homelands there. So they build houses there again. Across from here at Keiku Islands, they built houses there. Their village used to be known as Kikluwutki. It's hard to say with jet lag. Uh, and it's the little nostril of cake. And it's a very descriptive name. There is a, a little nostril there, a hole. Um, and that was their original site, but the people actually had never seen it, right? Because the, their grandfathers had replaced each other. So several generations had lived in the interior, but so descriptive were the names that when they came back to this place, they recognized it because the, the name was like a picture, if you will, uh, a guide to it. But they couldn't settle there because the water level had risen. And uh, today, there's, if you go to this site, you see there's really not enough beach here to live on. And so the rest of the narrative is actually exploring other sites. And uh, it's a, the whole narrative, or a, I, I would say it's probably an abbreviated version of the longer narrative, but uh, contains 36 place names, references to 36 different place names. Um, and they're all, we decided to map them. But it's basically a, a very good exploration of some of the more productive areas uh, around cake. Uh, and how they were discovered or rediscovered after the flood. Uh, and of course, some of these names are uh, still on regalia. This is one that uh, Ruth Demert, who was our uh, local research coordinator in Cake, uh, she has that uh, drum, which is representative of a, of a sockeye stream in uh, Little Pibus Bay, I think, right, Harold? Yeah. yeah. And uh, anyway, I think those kinds of connections just show you how powerful place names can be in holding the history and geography uh, in people's minds and hearts. <coughs> okay, and so finally, I think, the, from, again, from an academic standpoint, but also a personal standpoint, um, to me, looking at place names, I think we found that they're still obviously very resonant in people's minds. They're quite resilient, as the example just shows, and they're obviously worthy of, of respect. And uh, I'm going to turn it over to Harold now, and he's, he can describe a little bit about how we worked in each community. And then I think after that, we'd like to invite some of the people uh, who worked on the book to uh, maybe say a few words. And I know we have uh, Harvey and uh, Nels, uh, I speak for, for Sitka, uh, or Charlie, and uh, Kenny Grant from, from Huna. And uh, we don't have. Ruth isn't here. I was hoping we'd have one of our local research coordinators, but she's got a dance, I think, at two. So. Um, but we'll welcome them to come up and say something uh, in addition. But I'll turn it over to Harold. Oh. <coughs> Thank you, Tom. <coughs> uh, my name is uh, Harold Martin. My second name is Hodgkies. Uh, I'm of the Raven Moiety, I belong to the Tlingit tribe. 
I uh, come from the Duck Dean Town clan, and I come from the East Cootie Hit, which is the Raven's Nest House. I was born and raised in Cake, which is located on the south uh, west side of Cooperknob Island, uh, but my traditional homeland is Huna, and I grew up in our traditional subsistence way of life. I received my, uh, well, I was a high school dropout, actually, and uh, when joined the Marine Corps and got in on the tail end of Korea, uh, after I got out, I got my GED, I received my uh, BA degree in business administration from uh, Western Washington University in Bellingham. I also received a, a associate in applied science degree in uh, uh, management from Whatcom Community College, also in Bellingham. I received an associate in applied science degree in uh, aquaculture and fisheries from the Lumbe Indian School of Aquaculture, also in Bellingham. I'm going to skip most of my background and go right to the uh, In 1980, we moved back to Juneau, where I did my uh, graduate studies uh, here at the University of Alaska uh, Southeast. I uh, completed all my coursework in uh, public administration, and right at finals time in April, my dad died. I had to go to Petersburg and take him to cake, and so I missed out on the finals. I didn't know that I had I could could have wrote a contract out with our professor and take my. Uh, finals later, but when I came back, they told me I had to take my semester all over again. And uh, at my age, I, you know, I went back to school when I was 40 years old. I took my wife, she went to school with me, and we took our five kids and went back to school. And uh, it's opened a lot of doors for us. In 1982, I, uh, I, I went to work for Central Council of Tengen Hiding and Tribes of Alaska as a uh, <clears throat> Excuse me. As a tribal operations officer, I worked with uh, uh, federally recognized tribe, tribal governments, uh, traditional tribal councils, and as well as uh, municipal, state, and federal agent, uh, uh, governments. In 1994, I became a subsistence director. Uh, at that time, I was also the president of the. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, I've. Uh, Scratchy through the Southeast Native Subsistence Commission. And uh, <clears throat> it was the summer of 1990, 1982 when Tom came to me with, uh, with uh, an idea of doing a place names project. Uh, as we talked, it, uh, you know, we, we talked about the importance of the names and uh, we talked about uh, losing our elders and uh, we never thought beyond uh, our elders passing on, uh, it, it just suddenly dawned on me that uh, whenever we lost an elder, uh, a wealth of cultural knowledge went with, the, with that elder. And uh, it just uh, suddenly seemed urgent to, to, to begin documenting a, a play, place names on, on our, our land. So we applied for a, a grant from the National Park Service a Historic Preservation Grants and received it. In 1995, we began this Place Names project. <coughs> and one of the reasons, you know, I think Tom said it best when he, the reason, you know, place names and why they should be preserved. Uh, when he said, uh, uh, and I quote, uh, for Southeast Alaska Natives, the most fundamental subsistence resource is the land itself. Indigenous place names are valuable linguistic artifacts containing a wealth of cultural and environmental information concerning our regions, land, and waters. I think he just covered everything. At this, it, you know, at this time, uh, we were subsistence was a hot topic at that. That was shortly after Anilka, and we were having problems with the state, the Fish and Game Department, and uh, environmentalists. Everybody else, everybody's in the act. But in uh, our, you know, pre-European, uh, prior to the Europeans coming to our country, we are. 
people already had names for uh, all parts of Southeast. We had, we had names for uh, uh, our in, uh, surrounding environment, uh, bays, creeks, rivers, mountains, reefs, as well as places of uh, significance. Uh, our first task was uh, <coughs> to go out to the community and get, get uh, permission from the uh, communities. Uh, Tom and I started by going to uh, Angoon first, I believe. And, uh, we met with the uh, IRA uh, Council, which is a federal recognized tribal government, and as well as the elders. We explained our, uh, our, our proposed project and uh, we received permission from them. Uh, each community is usually made up of one clan that settled the, uh, that village and other clans moved in for some reason or another, mostly marriage, I believe. Uh, we did have an understanding with the elders uh, that we would not uh, inquire about sacred sites or culturally sensitive areas. Uh, we received great cooperation and uh, <clears throat> While talking to people, we uh, talked to one one person, asked him about certain areas, and we hit on one area where this man said, he said, oh, I can't talk about that particular area. He said, this is who you have to go talk to. It's their territory. So, you know, even today, it, it, it shows that our people still have respect for each other's territories. The protocol still lives. You know? There were uh, several inf incidents in the, in, uh, <clears throat> uh, after uh, Tom and I did a, a presentation in Anchorage. I was approached by a young lady from the uh, Fairbanks Daily News Miner, uh, who she asked about uh, examples of place names. I, I gave her uh, uh, an example on uh, place called Chapin Bay, in a, a mountain in Chapin Bay on Admiralty Island. Uh, I think the name was Shark Woods, which meant that there was a hole through the mountain near the top. And just as, uh, just, I just told her that from time to time people have observed geese flying through that, the hole in that mountain. And when she wrote up the news article, uh, <laughs> she uh, said that uh, the cake people did not start their subsistence activities until geese were observed flying through the hole in the mountain, which was very absurd and silly. It made me look silly to the people of okay, K. I remember Ruth Demmer talking to me. She said, oh, Harold. She said, when I read it, I said, Oh, Harold. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I did, I felt silly about how she wrote it up. There was nothing a lot I can do about it. <laughs> On a lighter note, uh, when we were meeting with Cake, uh, Cake IRA, and uh, uh, a number of elders, we had a, we put a chart on the table. We were gathered around the table, and uh, people were putting out names, and uh, there was uh, one name that, uh, you know, Tom likes to be real precise on his pronunciation and, 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 and uh, this one name he couldn't really say it, but it came out sounding like uh, uh, a reference to the uh, private parts of the human anatomy. And the woman laughed, you know, and uh, <laughs> quite a good laugh. Another one he tried to say came out like, uh, that's a good reference to lovemaking. <laughs> and I told him, don't, don't say these things in public, you know. And, uh, but we had a good laugh. I broke the ice, and uh, after that, everything was a lot more relaxed. And initially, there was some uh, uh, opposition to this project. We heard from several people saying that, why are you going to give away our, our, our subsistence areas, you know? And in reality, the uh, 
State Fish and Game Department, the uh, National Fisheries Service, the uh, Forest Service, they've already documented every creek in Southeast and, and identified the, the, the species that uh, occupy those creeks and rivers and areas where the deer, there's moose and there, brown bear, black bear and everything else. So we weren't encroaching on anything there. Anyway, upon the, upon the completion of uh, our first uh, charge, we did this in three phases, I believe. Got three different grants. And anyway, un, uh, upon the completion of our, our project, we uh, took the charge out to the various communities where they were uh, received with great enthusiasm. Uh, like I said, this was a time of uh, 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 subsistence was a hot topic. and. Uh, from time to time, I, I've worked on subsistence uh, and went to many, many meetings, uh, organized many organizations throughout the state. And at times there were state or federal agencies or uh, conservation environmentalists saying that there's no evidence that uh, certain areas were ever used by the natives for subsistence purposes or, or otherwise. And, uh, all we had to do is look at the chart and uh, that these charts run in uh, our various communities and it proves otherwise. There's, there's nowhere in, in Southeast Alaska that was never, not used by Davis for one, one reason or another at, at any time. You look at the maps, you, you'll see it's all dotted up and we've used every, everything. In uh, retrospect, I just felt bad that we couldn't do this uh, 40 years earlier when we could have talked, actually interviewed uh, a lot of the elders that were still alive. But uh, we were fortunate that we, we could talk with the elders that, that knew, uh, I still knew a lot of place names. I, uh, <clears throat> in Cake, I told, uh, I told Tom that uh, I, I forgot a lot of names. Because uh, when I was a kid growing up on my, my dad's same boat, uh, <clears throat> the, the principal language in the house was Tlingit. And uh, my dad, when he told my mom where, where, where we're going, uh, he didn't, she didn't say, uh, uh, we're going to Saginaw Bay. Uh, what's the name? Skanach. Skanach, yeah. He yeah. says, <laughs> And he said, from there we'll go to certain other places. He said all this in Flinket. Oh, we had names for everything, you know. And, uh, I, I retired in uh, 2000, and uh, Dr. Tom Thornton continued on the project. and. Uh, uh, I feel that this book will be a, a great educational tool for our children. Uh, we're working right now and uh, we're, we're, we're proposing a project to uh, Sea Alaska Heritage Foundation with Dr. Rosita Worrell. And uh, on one of the, I think Tom did one for Angoon and Cake, uh, where he did a little CD and uh, <clears throat> you put it in your computer a map pops up on the, on, the, on the screen and you put your cursor on a certain name, it'll give you the exact pronunciation, uh, what the name means and, and where it came from. And it's, we haven't done this on this book. This book is all numbers and names. And, uh, but we're proposing a follow-up. Uh, I, I, think, I think it means that we have to go out and get permission again from all these communities to do this. But uh, it's something we're looking at. I think uh, it'll simplify this and be a good uh, learning tool, educational tool for our, our school children. I'd like to just thank uh, Sea Alaska Heritage Foundation, Rosita World, for publishing this book. This concludes my brief presentation. We'll open the floor for questions, or do you have people talk, want to talk? Yeah, Harvey? Just, yeah. Other, uh, I just want to add a couple of thanks too to uh, all of the tribes obviously who cooperated to the National Park Service for the Heritage Grant Program 
Um, sea Alaska, of course, has been mentioned. Um, Fish and Game actually helped back some of the research that uh, started this. And uh, Mike Blackwell, who supported publication of the book, very much appreciate that. Dick Dauenhauer was, uh, and, and wife Nora were, were backup linguists, uh, along with Jeff, Jeff Lear, uh, reviewed a lot of the, the lists and uh, made a lot of important corrections, particularly on spelling. And uh, sorry, I'm leaving. Oh, Clara Rizel, who designed the cover, which is quite an interesting design, incorporating uh, some place names if you look closely. And especially, uh, I wanted to thank Mike Travis, who's here and worked behind the scenes, but he typeset the entire book, but really functioned as an editor as well, uh, catching a lot of mistakes in the end. And uh, uh, you don't know how lonely publication can be when you get down to it. It's often just a couple of people working <laughs> to get these, uh, these things uh, down. And uh, so Michael and I had a lot of back and forth at the end of this book. And uh, he put in a lot of hours and I uh, hope he's happy with the, with the product. Um, yeah, and if I, I don't know if I've left anyone else out, but uh, I want to just, just a big thank you to all who participated. And it is literally hundreds of people who uh, contributed in one way or another to the production of the book. And I guess with that, we'd invite anyone else who wants to speak. Um, I was hoping, uh, Nels, do you want to say something? <laughs> Some of you may know that I was adopted by Herman Kitka, who was uh, the leader of the Sitka Kaguantan and was one of our most knowledgeable place name informants. Uh, and we got over 500 names in Sitka, uh, partly with his help and his uncle, Charlie Joseph. <coughs> I would like to thank my clan brother, Yanji Gok, for the opportunity to say a few words at this time. I wasn't directly involved in the place name projects, but my uncle Kusatan Herman was intimately involved with Yonji Gok and putting together some place names for the Sitka area. There were several other people that worked with the Sitka tribe of Alaska. They all worked together to provide the, the names for the Sitka area. I think the beginnings of that was the tapes left behind by Charlie Joseph. For a long time, those tapes sat idle, sat on the shelf, and Charlie's daughter, Ethel McKinnon, and her partner, Vita Davis, started translating and transcribing those names. They found that they lacked a little bit in a little bit of geographic knowledge. So Mark Jacobs began to help them, and as did my uncle, Herman Kitka, he began to put the names in the right place. That's the information that they shared with Yanchi Gong. My uncle is no longer with us, but his words and his knowledge are still with us in the books that Tom has put together, not only in this book, but the other books that Tom has read. I want to thank George E. Cock for that, and, and also my Marine buddy here. Thank you. Welcome. Ken? <laughs> you know, I, I had, well, my name is <coughs> Kenny Grant, as uh, Tom said, and 
Harold is over there, and I'm really honored to, uh, I've got some Kaguantans sitting out there, and uh, my father's people, I really, really feel uh, comforted with your presence here, <coughs> and I see Harvey over here too, He's, uh, his father was uh, my father too, so my father was <coughs> Kaguantan, and when my father passed away, uh, Herman took his place, his place, so. I feel really good. <clears throat> you know, I, I took a, um, you know, I work for the Park Service and they train us every day. Uh, it's uh, part of the, the way the, the Park Service operates. And uh, I took one training course and this, it was actually called Cru Crucial Con Conversation. And one of the things that he talked about really uh, struck home with me. Uh, he was talking about this file system that we all have. When I say, when somebody says a word, our file, our, our minds filter information that we want to, that fits the character that we are, you know. And, and uh, Anyway, to make it short, uh, when Tom was talking about the place names, uh, my file system was going crazy, you know, all these things. I was like, what am I going to talk about? <laughs> Well, any one thing, what we were doing in the park service, <coughs> that we were doing, working on wilderness character, and the, the individual that was writing these uh, beautiful statements about the wilderness, she did uh, uh, statements about uh, Olympic uh, National Park and, and different parks. And, and when you read it, it just about lulls you. I mean, the, the words that she uses, you know, as a matter of fact, when I was reading it, I was I had to use a dictionary to find out what she was saying. It's so, just just so, I mean, they're, they're beautiful words. <laughs> but you know, when talking about uh, our land here, uh, I take Glacier Bay because it's the one I'm most familiar with. When an individual comes in, uh, they see orcas, they see whales, they see the beautiful shoreline, you know, the, and uh, all the animals. It's a uh, very natural, very, very natural. And and we were tasked with writing uh, a wilderness statement. I went to Huna and I asked. Uh, we had some elders there yet. A lot of them are are gone to the other side now. I asked, "What's wilderness?" And it's just like their fuse blew, you know, you know. In, in our culture, there is no wilderness. Everything out there, it's their homeland. And in our culture, we say, Hastu'ani, or what? Hastu'ani, this is their land, you know. And um, the thing that, uh, that really struck me when uh, Tom was working on the place names, very descriptive, like he says, and there's uh, owner. To me, the biggest thing is the ownership part of it. Uh, he had the Sitco Bay there, and he had a stream there, and the Spatini. And uh, to me, this is the biggest part of our culture: ownership. You know. When I talk about Glacier Bay, we talk about uh, the natural part. But for us, when, when an individual goes into Glacier Bay, he's going into a community. He or she's going into a community. Because uh, at the beginning, there's the tree people, and there's the whales. The whales are part of our culture, what we're wearing. They're individuals. The keet, the killer whale is part of the community. The point, uh, red ribbon point, Glacier Bay, sit Bay, place where the glacier was. Something is happening here. Something is happening here. That I, on the end of the word, is makes it a possessive word. Katini. 
the river that belongs to the Sakai. And it's not just the fish to us. The Sakai are people, the fish people. So anyway, that was the part that, that really struck me about, about this place name. And, uh, I think it's, it's a very valuable thing. I heard, I was Googling, I know a lot of you Google, and I came upon this site where an individual was talking about a tribe in northern Mexico. And it, was, it's, it caught my attention when he said that, uh, he was talking about, you know, a lot of the, our, our lower 48, our, our indigenous people, they talk about um, Mother Earth and Father Sky. And he had a very interesting word that, that he used that got my attention. He called it kin-centric, kin-centric family. And I tried to apply it to our, our place up here, but I couldn't do it. <laughs> I think we live in a community. Ours is a community because there's the tree people, there's the mountain, and to us, the glacier, the glacier has a spirit. The mountain has a our mountain, Harold and I, we, we, have, we share the same mountain, Mount Fairweather. To us, it's a living thing. It's a spiritual thing. And, uh, we have stories where uh, Mount Fairweather is actually a tribal house, where the door is open. <coughs> there. Anyway, place names is just part of it, too, because there's a whole to me, I'll give you this. To me, it's a symphony. Everything has its place in it, and uh, the names are a part of it, too. Anyway, the take-home message, as far as I'm concerned, it's, aside from his descriptions, is that everything out there has a spirit, and we give it. We, our ancestors, our grandparents that did it, not, not us. Our grandparents did it when they put the eye on the end of the word, Fahim, the stream that belongs to the Sakai people. Anyway. Good to see you. <laughs> Thank you Thanks to me. Nelson, to Ken. So I guess um, if there are any questions, we'd be happy to answer them, try to answer them. Or if anyone else would like to say something who's been involved. Thank you, Tom. I want to thank you and Harold for getting this book together. I know my father had some things to do with it. But if it wasn't for you guys, it wouldn't have happened. So I want to thank you guys. I, some of the names are very important. I know the, a lot of the names had to do with where our people came from, uh, where we originated, how um, the different clans, some of them came from different places. The names were important to that and how their, their names came about. So, and places where we get our food and things. Uh, Knowing that we had lost some of that and, and growing up, and now some of the names have changed somewhat in our minds. Uh, some of our, uh, just uh, put it in different words, uh, some of our codes for, for fishing, and I think fishermen understand this a little more because. Uh, we had one place in Sitka where uh, the salmon would show up on Mother's Day. It was the Mother's Day fishing ground in there on. <laughs> and there's other places like where my wife likes to fish. The genus fishing ground. <laughs> so things are changing a little bit as we go along. But some of these names are very important. And I thank you guys. Cheers.
I think that's an important theme is that hopefully, <coughs> certainly my wish, I'm sure Harold's too, is that new names get inspired, whether they're English names or they're Clinket names. And of course, we've seen that with buildings here in Juneau getting Clinket names, certainly a lot more since I came to Juneau originally. I've seen at least a dozen have gotten Clinket names. It's the same thing in Sitka. Almost every new building that goes up, they contemplate putting a, a native name on it. And uh, that's a tradition that should continue. There's no reason why it, it has to be uh, just from the past. I mean, that was always a process of uh, establishing a relationship with the place, was to give it a name. <laughs> Go ahead, Kathy. My name is Kathy Ruddy, and I, I wanted to say two things. Um, first of all, I've been, since I first heard about this book being in the making maybe eight years ago, I've been looking forward to it with great anticipation, and I'm very pleased that uh, Silaska uh, Heritage has, has issued it. Um, the first thing is about um, the misunderstandings between languages. If you only speak one language, you don't always understand how um, a slight mispronunciation can transfer over. I see French speakers here. I have the privilege of having studied French. And there's a point at which if you're a woman and you say, I'm full, meaning I've had lots to eat, you're saying you're pregnant, you know? So <laughs> <laughs> these are the kinds of things that unilingual people don't always understand. So I'm very pleased to, uh, to hear that these, um, you know, that this has been worked through uh, as, you're, as you've been um, putting this book together. And the second thing is, is when we're out on the water, I carry the ORTH book, uh, the place names, until it's just about fallen apart. And I'm so eager to have your book now uh, on the water to, uh, to search out the, um, the, the, the original etiology of, of the, uh, the, the, these place names. And I'm so eager um, to see the PDF or, or what, you were, what you were speaking about that, that will permit more searchability, because now the searchability is, is limited. And I'm just very um, uh, grateful for the Huni Indian Association chart that has the, um, the Clinket names and the, uh, uh, the English names and is in alphabetical order. Um, I, I'm, I'm eager for that to be the, the same for, um, for this particular book. So uh, there's a little more searchability. So it's just my great thanks to, um, to you both and to C.S. <coughs> for, for producing this. Yes. Hi, my name is Sue Schrader, and um, I just returned from 10 gorgeous days. Well, they weren't all gorgeous, some were in, in Glacier Bay. Um, it's a trip that I've made many, many times over the last 20 years. Um, and I so appreciate your comments. I recognize you from the video. Oh. <laughs> um, and my question is uh, whether or not there is any move by any organization or entity to work with the powers that be, of course, in the Bay would be the federal government, to see about getting some of the original names or traditional names restored. <coughs> I love that park, and every time I go in and look at the chart, because I do all the navigation on the boat mm -hmm. and see the Johns Hopkins Glacier, I can just feel <laughs> my anger on how this gorgeous place got associated with, with these names, and, and Blue Mouse Cove. And my understanding, it may not be accurate, is that Blue Mouse is named after a cafe or a jazz club in New York City. Um, so in summary, uh, my question is, is there any move to try <coughs> to get some official recognition for these names, and indeed to get some of these names changed? Uh, actually, we, um, <coughs> in the original report, when we did the database, at the end of the database was a, a form for the Board of Geographic Names for people to enter um, the tribe or whoever, if they wanted to enter this as a, as a name they wanted to put forward to make it become, I guess, part of the official gazetteer or cartography. So there is a process for doing that. and. Uh, 
but we felt it wasn't our responsibility, it was really kind of a local responsibility, so we tried to sh show them how to do it. And uh, my understanding of the U.S. Board of Geographic Names, and, and at the state level there's a state board of geographic names, is that they're quite open to this, but, and that doc good documentation, which hopefully we've done here, is very important. But what's hard is to displace an existing name. So it's the McKinley problem. You know, you get, say, let's, let's call McKinley Denali, and then the, the Ohio delegation stands up in Congress and say, no, McKinley's our guy, because President McKinley was from Ohio. And so you can't do that. But then they one up them and named the whole area around it uh, the Denali Wilderness. So there are ways of, <coughs> of accommodating these things. But Obviously, as I think as that Sitco Bay map showed, that you could add quite a few names where there, are, there aren't existing names, and you could obviously clarify names like Sitco, which are right now not transparent what they mean. And uh, that one's an interesting one because it refers to a glacier, like Kenny was saying in Glacier Bay, but there's no glacier anywhere around there, so it's a, it's obviously an older name. So um, I think that's something people, a lot of people, like to see. And uh, there's definitely a, a process for doing that. My Linda? Name's Linda Kruger, and I work with the Forest Service with research. And it's not just building names that are coming about in Juneau. Um, we, last year, some of you were probably at the dedication of the new experimental forest, mm. in Latini. And Lillian helped us work with a wonderful group of um, local people to help figure out what would be the appropriate name for that place that would be representative. And I think I, if we can't had two or three, maybe even four, kind of names that we chose from in the end, but I think it means something like stream watcher. River watcher. Mm -hmm. Yeah, river watcher. And so we wanted to be very uh, sensitive to the place and sensitive to you know past use of place and the na different names and naming procedures. And so I think, you know, for me, I haven't heard any real complaints about it, but I think that's part of, of um, coming up with a process for naming places, you know, today, that maybe, maybe they had names once upon a time, but they've been lost, but we're being sensitive to how do we come up with names for them today. So um, well, hopefully those names all get recorded on these, on these maps as well. Thank you, Linda. I also wanted to share one anecdote and introduce someone else from the Forest Service. I'm Lillian Peter Shore. I work in tribal relations. And our regional leadership team was at a meeting in Prince of Wales a couple of years ago. And um, a gentleman, um, Brian Fulter, um, said to our regional leadership team that there's a creek on this island and it has a very offensive name. He said, what can we do um, to change the same. And so I want to introduce my colleague, Bob Francis, and his, this is a summary of what the Forest Service has been doing in collaboration with the tribes and the communities on Prince of Wales to, uh, with, with regard to that stream. I, I wasn't prepared for this, but uh, Bob Francis met with the Forest Service. So I got my Hawaiian shirt on today. It's Hawaiian shirt Friday. So, um, but I found out about the meeting today and Lily invited me and I was really excited about it. I've been working with geographic names now for, well, close to nine years now. Been representing the Forest Service here. I get to go to the Board of Geographic Names usually once a year to their conference and be able to converse with them and meet with them. And all the names that get proposed um, come through our office and that and then we do our write-up on it and so forth. And your process that you have that you mentioned there is that and I was kind of excited because I would like to see the native names be put on the features that are that they represent what they are. They're historical names. They are what the land. They are the landscape. They are. It talks about the people, the culture, and the history. It brings everything into play, and it is very personal there. <coughs> um, by doing this um, this project down on POW on this name and that the name of the creek was actually was not a, was an unofficial name that had been given to the name. The name was actually the bridge itself. And I don't like to say the word so I'm not gonna say it because you probably already know the word um, down there. But uh, working with the tribal communities with Richard Peterson down there from the uh Kassan. Kassan uh, uh, 
Village Dummett. And working with him, was able to get a name that was proposed by all the tribes down there. And it was, and I know I'm not gonna say this right, so forgive me, but Handalehana, uh, Stream Beautiful, or Beautiful Stream, as we would say. And that was actually able to, we put all the paperwork together, got all the supporting documents and that, and sent it forward to the state board. The state board um, passed it, and it went on to the U.S. Board of Geographic Names, which um, goes before the board next week on the 14th. So, and all indications are that it's going to, there hasn't been any opposition from any other different agencies or board members at this point. So chances are it's a very good possibility that it will get passed. And that will be able to put one more thing back on the map as a, as a bureau. Um, one thing that can be done um, is that these names where uh, these features have had other names already applied to them and they were made official by the U.S. Board of Geographic Names, is that those names can actually be placed in there as a variant mm -hmm. inside the thing. So yeah. they can be submitted and you can take the, the tribal name and actually submit it in there and it will go in the record as a variant name. So when it brings it up, we put down uh, you know, the sockeye stream and it pulls it up on the pulls it up in the thing, you know, underneath it, it'll have a variant name and give the ethnic name, and you can also put the you know, pronunciation in it, too. And that, so it makes it very nice for those kind of things. And I think it would, it's it's almost a full-time job is what you're, you're asking to do, is to get all these features named. Because each one of these features has to be mapped out, and they've done a lot of the work themselves. But then you also have to, each one of the names has to have a package to go to the package that goes together with it. But the U.S. Board of Geographic Names uh, has, for numerous years now, been very, very supportive of Native names. And they are even more supportive of our people marks and everything to accommodate and so forth. So, but um, normally if you put the packet together and it goes forward and it comes from one of the tribal organizations and that, the chances are it's going to be, that feature will be named if it doesn't already have a name to it. So, somebody's willing to do it, but like I said, there'd always be a full-time job. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. The process is fairly simple. You have a, a name added. It's a little more challenging if you would like to change, change a name. But changing a name is possible, but you need local support. Now, to... Uh, get into submitting a name or target name. There doesn't seem to be much local support to submitting names and going through the process. We've made several runs at that at Sitka, but like Tom has said, there are a great many land features, geographic features that currently lack names on the official maps. So those are the kind of things we should look at getting local support, local tribal support to submit those names to be through the Board of Geographic Names and have them added to the official map. Another layer on that is uh, many of the people who don't buy into Tlingit names, they, they always say, well, I can't say that. It's too hard to say. So I'd like to share with you a story about the name of a school here in Sitka, or Juno. It was given a name which was fairly easy to say. It's a Tiki King. There came a time when the principal of the school was standing up in public, commenting on how hard it was to say it's a Tiki King. Went on for quite a while about that. And one elder in the audience got up and said, you're saying it perfectly. So it's possible. <laughs> it's possible to learn how to say the names correctly. Thank you, Tom. Last word? <laughs> no. Oh, <okay. coughs> no, in regards to uh, uh, changing, changing names, uh, uh, that yesterday's paper, if you read yesterday's paper, there was an article in there about some school up north that uh, took offense to uh, racial names. Uh, this, this was grade school, mind you, and uh, 
one of the students uh, saw the name uh, Negro Head Mountain, and he took offense to it, and they took it to the higher ups, and they're doing actually doing something about it, and they're going to change that. So, uh, I guess uh, uh, racial names, derogatory names, could could be changed, but. Uh, as far as other names, I, I understand there's even a law against uh, changing some of these names. Uh, they're running to places like uh, McKinley's never ever set foot in Alaska, and yet, you know, I think uh, it should have, the park should have been named McKinley and the, the Mountain Denali. So, thank you. and you kind of touched on it when you showed your, your map of Sitco Bay. And that is whether, how, how we can use these place names to build a larger, a sense of a larger place and a larger area. And, uh, and obviously, it's all of Southeast Alaska, but, but there are certain areas that have names that may be linked geographically and through legends and through use and through different ways that, that create a larger uh, sense of place <coughs> that's, uh, that might be called you know, in a Western sort of national register type framework, uh, a cultural landscape or an indigenous landscape, um, which is used a lot nowadays in international conservation. Um, and I didn't know if there's uh, traditional concepts of that or, or somehow we could build on that, looking at that um, larger concept to try to look at these places not as isolated, discrete place names, but as parts of holes, of larger holes and, and places in a, in a broader sense. Mm -hmm. well, I'll just respond to that by saying I think that's exactly right. I mean, uh, <clears throat> when I first came to looking at place names, I was interested in trying to unpack each one. But the more you unpack them, the more you see, oh, they're all related to each other and the, like each one is almost like a knot and when you begin to undo it, it it leads to other places and you know there are these threads that that tie them together in what are essentially cultural landscapes and even the idea of putting a place in a point is an artificial representation because those points actually don't represent the whole area that's referred to by the place and I don't know if you could get consensus on what the area is amongst people, because it's actually probably a little different depending on their relationship. But I think you could, you could do a lot to connect the dots and begin to build those, um, those cultural landscapes. And I, I think the, um, what Johnny Jackson's narrative does is, is an example of that, that some of the Glacier Bay narratives uh, also that I've come across in the Dallin Howard's books and hearing them directly 
are also like that, then they constitute really these landscapes. In some, some cases you'd call them sacred landscapes. There's a map of a, of a story, the Salmon Boy story, that uh, is in here that it represents even underwater uh, landscapes that, uh, that uh, you know, the story is about a boy who's taken by the salmon and returns, but it's also a story about the way salmon come into Sitka Sound, and it, re it does represent <coughs> this very, very important marine seascape, I guess, or marine scape that is now, you know, a source of controversy in terms of whether or not they're doing the right things to conserve the, the bounty of that, uh, of that marine landscape, uh, particularly around herring. And, uh, but the names all suggest that uh, it's, it's very, very important and it's a system in itself. Um, and so there's a tremendous density, one of the highest densities of place names is in Sitka Sound that we documented anywhere. Um, and that's very, very significant of its, obviously, its cultural history, but also of its biological richness, I think. Wow. Yeah, Tom and Harold, I, I really appreciated hearing all the work that you guys have been doing. And it got me thinking about uh, place names as cultural things. and. Uh, uh, sort of maybe some some differences between our mainline larger American culture where for me place names are something a bit out there uh, they're not me and then the, uh, Kenny Grant got me thinking about uh, um, how what I thought you were saying Kenny was how really there isn't much of a separation between the place the name and the person and the culture it's somehow they're of the same, and uh, I think that's a lot what you're talking about as well, Tom, and kind of bringing bringing that view through, which is kind of at a at a meta level because uh, uh, very often we can't see things that we don't grow up with personally, and uh, so I really appreciate the the work from that point of view and also <coughs> the different perspectives it brought in about how uh, perhaps the person and the community or clan and the place and the place name aren't really in separate, they're not separate items, but uh, they're one, one, and, one and the same. And uh, so that sort of says that the cultural importance of place names isn't something out there that you visit, but it's at the center of a uh, cultural universe. So thanks so much. <laughs> I did sit with Herman for several times when he was going over the GI database on the tables to help you edit and to make sure that the names were correct. Setting up your database and database format really doesn't fit with the person who's been trained in, trained in navigation. When Herman was going over the maps trying to correct them at the GI database, it was going from left to right across right. the map. <laughs> names were going across the map from west to east and he, he was trying to think of going along the coast and the two didn't quite match and he had a very difficult time with that. That's the suggestion to make it a little bit easier for those who grew up on the land and on the water to be able to offer you some assistance. Yeah, it's a good point about the, how, <coughs> how to work with people and we actually did correct some of that in the final version but the point he's making is that rather than array your numbers sort of from top to bottom and, and left to right as, as an automated program will do, you're much better going along the coastline which is how people actually travel and remember places and that's it's absolutely right and uh, I remember working with some of the, la the ladies in particular who you'd, you'd have the map out there and they, they would never really, they'd look at the map and but often when they started talking they would look straight ahead and say, it's the first one on the right, and then, you know, then there's this, and then on the left you have this. And so they're literally traveling in their, in their mind, and they're not necessarily trying to reckon the map. So uh, maybe in this virtual world we could create that 
3D dimension, so it could be almost like you're traveling, because I think that's really the key to how understanding how places were named in the first place. Um, and all of that is, is distorted when you put it on a two-dimensional map. Yes? I was going to say an answer to that. This is one of the most complex books that I've personally worked on. I grew up here and I've been working with the last number of publications since 1989. And <coughs> that was something that ideally would have changed on the maps. Um, but there just wasn't time. The map maker up north gave it to us in that format. And at one point, I was thinking of donating my own time, if I had it, to go through and laboriously renumber everything on the map, move all those numbers around, and then have to renumber all the tables. And you know, maybe in uh, future work, especially if there's a electronic edition, you can do that. But number two is usually near <coughs> number, number one. So you can find it on the map. But the problem with Sitka is there's 500 and some <laughs> names on the map. So <laughs> they're all close together on one. I think there's two maps. So that's a problem, too, <laughs> the, sheer, the sheer number. Uh, Tom, uh, just, uh, just a comment on uh, your mention of uh, the salmon boy take, being taken by salmon people. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, the, the salmon boy was taken by uh, uh, the, the, the salmon because the boy disrespected uh, salmon bones. This, this was old salmon bones on the ground. And uh, uh, like my brother Ken stated that we believe everything has a spirit. Everything has a spirit Our environment in our environment. And so among our people, we did everything with respect to our environment. Uh, we talked to a tree before we cut it down. When we took a seal, I watched my dad uh, go through a ritual. And uh, in, 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 in effect, what he's doing is, is thanking the animal and uh, sending it back to the spirit world, thanking the animal for what, coming to us and sending it back to the spirit world so it can come back again. I mean, these are things, you know, we were taught when we were growing up, we, we never shot anything for nothing, we never killed anything for nothing, we never took more than we needed. Uh, the Sinkas culture is very, very complex, and you have to understand it to, to, to you know, to, to respect it. Because there's, there's some things people think are, are very dumb, things that we do that they think is very dumb because they don't understand it. You know? So we do everything with respect. There one last question there, comment.
with our children in such a way that you know, we are learning place names. We are, you know, as appropriate kids are able to learn these histories. If there is a disconnect between, um, you know, if they don't have those resources at home of elders who are able to show them their clan history and, and story, how what would you advise us? Please forgive me if I'm saying things wrong or asking things that I shouldn't be asking. I'm trying to. With this particular book, like I pointed out earlier, it, it's got all the names and uh, it, it's numbered. I would probably advise you to have a think and speak in person in your class when you go through it. But uh, like I said, we were planning a follow-up to this, where uh, the names are already there. Uh, what we'd like to do is uh, 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 put it on a CD and get the, the uh, you know, when you pull it up on your computer, put your cursor on a name, it'll give you the, the, the correct pronunciation, uh, what it means, and, and where it came from. But that's in the works. Do you teach here in Juneau? Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Nels. Thank you. Thank you for that question. When I was growing up in my early years, I, I was fortunate enough to spend a few years with my grandmother. She began to teach me a lot. But when my mother got TV, we ended up in on it, and my father decided to cultural away from our people for, for a long time. I returned to Sitka, the place I was raised in 1980. When I returned, things had changed a lot from when I was a boy. Being Indian was okay. Learning your culture was valid. So as a number of elders talk, sit down and talk, what they taught me, they said, told me, don't only teach your people, teach those around you. It's very important. We need to teach those around us so that they know who we are, and know why we do things, and know how we do things. And when the people around us know those things, but it's our job it's like somebody else's job the knowledge that Tom has captured and put in the book that's a very good story <coughs> so we have a responsibility to ourselves to our children to our grandchildren Take the names out of that book and put it in our hearts and in the hearts of our children and grandchildren. Like my sonny boy says, the names on the land is a big part of our culture. So it's our responsibility to take it out of the book and put it in our mind and our hearts so that our children and grandchildren can have that same knowledge. We also need to keep those around us. Should we close? <laughs> <laughs> yep. Okay, right. Enough. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. And I guess uh, we're, we're going to sign some books. If people want them, people want us to, we're happy to do it. <laughs>